Welcome to the Parasite Podcast, a show about me and you. We are Venom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of the Parasite Podcast. This is going to be a new show here where we kind of focus on not me, because obviously for the past 500 episodes plus now, you've heard me talk about Venom, talk about different stories, and I continue to do that on our regular Venom vlog show. But the Parasite Podcast is more me turning the spotlight to the parasites. And the parasites, for people who don't know, are kind of what we call our fan base. It's a term of endearment, much like in the Venom movie when he refers to uh, the alien symbiote as a parasite. He's like, parasite! Why would you call me that? Apologize. And so, uh, so I, you know, in turn, as a term of endearment, we call all of us ourselves the parasites. And each episode of this podcast is me finding a different parasite, as it were, um, to talk to. You know, and we, I want to get to know them. I want to share their stories with you guys. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about how they got into comics and what their view is on Venom, and if they have a favorite Venom moment or Venom favorite interpretation, anything like that. And with me today for my first episode, because I couldn't think of who to do my first episode with better than my old co-host on nerd nation mr gene hoyle thank you so much for being here dude hello there and you know i'm, I'm glad you chose me for the first episode however you're all gonna be downhill after this you know that right <laughs> yeah i mean all these other guests they have a lot to follow i mean it's a tough act to follow dude i agree completely <laughs> and gene uh you know real quickly a little background on us like uh you know and i want actually i want your perspective on it just let the audience know kind of how you and I came to be and how we became friends and a little bit about Nerd Nation maybe and then uh, maybe some future plans you have with that and then we'll dive into some you know just general questions I have for you. Absolutely. Um, there was a time right around right around 2010 where I decided that I had to um, become more of the comics community because I had drifted for a while. And a po podcast, of course, was the perfect way to do that. Um, so I started Nerd Nation, which became Nerd Nation Radio. Um, at one point, on I, I think it was 2011, Zeke may have to correct me on that, but there was an article about Zeke on a website called Bleeding Cool. And um, it was it was a really fascinating story about what Zeke had been through and how comics helped him through it. And he got to make this big grand announcement at Comic-Con in front of you know some of the DC people. And that enough was alone to make me want to just contact them, not so much to like you know to the interview although that was my intention but also just to kind of get to know the guy a little bit um and eventually less than a year later he was actually my uh co-host on the show yeah that's right it was it was really weird you're like hey man i know i don't know you but you know would you like to uh let's talk let's just be friends and i was like okay so we became facebook friends and then you're like like a couple months later you're like hey they're doing this new 52 thing would you like to review every episode uh, or every issue with me and i luckily at that point I think I had, I think I still had a job at that point, so I was able to buy comics, and, uh, and yeah, me and you, every week, we went and bought all the number ones, and every week, we reviewed them. We did, like, 13 reviews a week for four weeks. It was uh, quite a way to uh, be the strong foundation for a friendship. Yes, and it also, here, here's one of the best things. Uh, actually, I think it was five parts, but I might be wrong, um, but here's the thing. I was only in four of them. Like, within weeks of recruiting Zeke to one of my podcasts, I bailed on him because I was going on a trip, and I would be unavailable <laughs> to do it. So I, I made him go solo almost right away. <laughs> yeah, that's... You know, I kind of forgot about that. You're right. You, you kind of did just leave me in, like, uh, uncharted waters. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, screw that kid, he'll get it done. <laughs> yeah, I was like, we were on a, a ship together, and you just threw me overboard, and you're like, eh, I'm sure he knows how to swim. <laughs> oh, well, you know, being on a ship is exactly where I was. I was in international waters and unable to even call in for the show. That's right. And so, yeah, you did kind of leave me. Uh, that's all right, though. I mean, I think that just that just showed me what kind of friend you really are and uh, and that I have to watch my back <laughs> around you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But uh, I, honestly, I think one of the criteria for choosing a partner for this new 52 review that we did was someone that, just like myself, was dumb enough to buy all the books and uh, it worked out really really well yeah it sure did um and we uh, and because of that though we did you know working on nerd nation together uh and me living in la and you living in you know florida um it was really great because between the two of us we had a lot of ability to make connections to uh, local artists and, and different people and businesses to uh, promote nerd nation to promote comic books and I thought we did a really great job with that show, and uh, and I miss it tremendously. And so, I, of course, what's on my mind all the time, and and definitely a couple other people's, is do you have any other plans to 
maybe not Nerd Nation, but uh, but bring back a show or do another show in the future? Uh, Nerd Nation Radio will definitely be back. Um, for for a couple of years, I think three years, I did it with um, my buddy Jack, who was always, always kind of on the periphery of Nerd Nation, mm-hmm. um, just kind of floating around there. And my buddy Kurt, we did it, and uh, we were insane. We were doing two or three episodes a week, and it was uh, it was a lot, but it was a lot of fun. And uh, we eventually had to stop because you know we all had stuff to do, and it kind of went by the wayside. But we really want to bring it back. We've been talking about how best to do that, so I'm hoping. That you'll hear something about that in the next six months or so. That's great. So uh, all of you out there who are listening, as soon as Gene updates any information about Nerd Nation Radio coming back, you will definitely hear me plug it, and then you will definitely probably hear me on the show because I will beg Gene to at least let me guest on an episode once or twice. Absolutely. <laughs> and if you want to listen to some of the uh, episodes I did with Seek or the ones I did with Jack and Kurt or even with my first host, just go search Nerd Nation Radio online. If I told you all the different podcast aggregates we we're on, we'd go through the entire 40 minutes of our <laughs> show here. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it's, it's on Blog Talk Radio. It's in a bunch of places. So, yeah, like you said, if you Google Nerd Nation Radio and if you want to slap in Nerd Nation Radio Gene, G-E-N-E at the end, I'm sure you'll see a bunch of stuff pop up, including a lot of the great interviews that we were able to do um, and big shout-outs to companies like Marvel and DC and some of the indie people that, you know, were – able to make time for us and be on that show. It was really a, a great time and some fond memories of my life. And it led me to, to learn how to speak better in front of people between doing your show and then and hanging out with Dan Harmon and then going to panels with you. Like It really helped me get through some of the toughest things for me, which was uh, you know opening up. And now people will be like, oh, great. This, so that's the reason you can't shut up is because of Gene Hoyle. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, this is the guy to blame if you think I talk too much. <laughs> Yeah, and and worth mentioning is, uh, you know, we were on opposite sides of the country, and we're both dirt poor all the time, but uh, somehow we managed to hang out at Comic-Con the one year I got to go. Uh, we got to hang out at New York Comic-Con and got paid for it, which was awesome, and then we met here in Florida twice, so uh, it was kind of neat. It was. It was It was a good time, and now I live here in Florida, and who knows what kind of shenanigans will happen in the future between us. Exactly. There will be shenanigans. <laughs> there will be shenanigans, and I will pistol whip the next person who says the word shenanigans. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so Gene, some basic questions here. Uh, one of them, obviously, it's the start. I ask everybody this, or I'm gonna, you know, as the show progresses, um, is you know what kind of got you into comic books? Because I think all of us have our comic book origin story, and I'd like to hear yours so the audience can know it. As a reader? Yeah, as a reader. Wow, I, I was pretty young. I was having a lot of trouble uh, with basic reading skills. Uh, I wasn't able to do it. It was just really, really hard for me. Um, and I struggled and I struggled. And finally, my first grade teacher, um, who was worried that I was going to end up you know, left behind, uh, she gave me a comic. It was an old Silver Age issue of Superman. I want to say it was 164, but it might have been 194. It was Superman's Day of Truth, which had, like, back then, Superman had, like, four or five stories in a single issue. Um, and that really made me want to know what was happening in these stories. And the combination of pictures and, and words really struck me. And it really made a difference in my life. And I, I became, not only became a reader, I became a voracious reader. I was reading everything I could get my hands on, but I never lost my love for comics. That's, uh, that's awesome. I mean, yeah, for those who don't think of comic books in that way, there are kids who struggle uh, with with connecting to you know words uh, especially and have and have trouble communicating and they're kind of in this shell and this bubble of, you know of their own design and everything kind of keep people out or keep themselves distance from people and there's a bunch of different reasons there's people that are on the spectrum that do this people that aren't and there's everyone in between and so to hear someone and that's one of the reasons I love talking to you too is because comic books like there there was an educational level to it for you something that pulled you in and like you said now you're a vivacious reader you, you read every chance you get and uh and you have been for years and it's also expanded your vocabulary led you to you know especially with that vocabulary i'm sure at some point you were like hey i should do a show because of the vocabulary comics gave me and the passion comics gave me oh absolutely i've always I always wanted to be a part of the community in every way I can. And if you go through my life, it's a long series of me finding different ways to be a part of comics. 
you know, from being a, a big reader and a collector. I think actually at one point in my elementary school, I had a um, we had some kind of open house in the library, and I brought my collection with me for people to look at. Um, you got stuff like that. You've got that. I've worked at various comic stores, doing the podcast, even trying to create my own comics in the past couple of years. That's true, and I want to get to that here in a second, but to backstep for a moment, like, again, I think that's what makes us great friends is that similarity of you and I, I think, just cosmically have been tethered to comics, you know, our whole lives. Like, for me, like, it was a surprisingly a head injury as a kid put me in the hospital, and my mom bought me my first comics while I was recovering, and before then, she never even thought about comic books as, as something that I would probably be into, and from then, I became like this you know, hermit type kid recluse that would sit in the corner and read his comics and play with his toys. And only the only ever time I spoke out for years was just if I happened to see another kid with a comic book or a superhero shirt, which back in the eighties was a very rare thing. Oh, absolutely. Um, until 89, I think uh, comic book shirts were kind of rare. That's true. Like Batman, yeah. Batman changed all that. Yeah. Cause when you got the VHS of Batman, you could order like baseball caps and mugs and t-shirts and uh, Converse sneakers, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, Batman definitely changed the game. So, yeah, me and you, I think there's that cosmic level of whether we're buying comics, working in comic shops, writing comics, editing comics. You and I have done all of it, made shows that talk about comics. Like, we are on a very similar path, on a scary level, too, like health-wise on a similar path as well, which none of us could have foreseen happening. But before we get to that part, I would love to talk to you about you creating comics like your love going so strong that you're like i can't just talk about them anymore i can't just buy them anymore i have to make them what was the was there a specific moment or a series of events that just kind of was like i'm gonna t tip into the other side of this uh this passion um there was always a part of me that liked to write and and there was actually a oh you almost always a part of me that did write uh from when i was very young i i kind of wrote this comic book thing about this this kid named dan and he had a mole that was his best friend <laughs> and uh, i didn't know what a mole looked like i had no idea what a mole was so it was a circle with like two little legs or four little legs and then <laughs> some eyes and whiskers that was my mole and it was their adventures and and i did that and then uh, you know i did the uh the young teenage thing where I, I wrote all this sad poetry, which was disgusting and terrible and then um i eventually started doing fiction stories but there was always that part of me that, that had um, an idea that I wasn't good enough, that I could not do this on any kind of level where people would read my stuff. Um, and this went on for a long time. I wrote most of a novel that no one has ever seen. Uh, and I don't even know where it is anymore, so no one ever will see it. But uh, when I moved to Florida, I got part of, I became part of the community here, the comic book indie community, which was really big and thriving. And talking to these people, I realized, I think I can do this. And I think the, the final push was in 2011, 2012, um, Seek kind of brought me in to help, uh, help wrangle and edit on a book called Soul Star, which, is, again, is very important to, uh, I think, Seek and I's relationship, especially with what would happen later. But um, Soul Star made me think to myself, I think I can do this. And so uh, I started writing a book called Gateway Runners. That was my first published comic, and I would that I self-published and you know did a Kickstarter for it and all that great stuff. And um, I've been doing it ever since. I've done I've self-published a bunch. I've worked with other people, which I prefer because I hate the business end of it. Um, I love to write comics for other people, you know, and that's that's really what I want to do for the rest of my life, as long as that might be. That's yeah. That's that's great. And yeah, and, and I, I, that's amazing that Soul Star was kind of a part of that journey of you going to the other side. And that's kind of on some level what I was hoping. First of all, Dan and the Mole sounds like a great book. You should bring that back. Um, and uh, and Soul Star, Gene was right. It's like uh, I, I, I didn't know what to do post aneurysm. And I, I know Gene. You know, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute too. But I know Gene understands probably now even more so uh, what that's like of, of how lost you can feel, how angry you are, um, how how unfair things are. It's uh, it it magnifies um, after you go through something traumatic like a brain injury um, or an aneurysm. You know, in our cases, 
it changes you. And uh, and I did. I struggled. There were so many things that I struggled with in those first couple years, talking to people, patience, you know, anger management. Uh, there was one job I used to work that I, I snapped at a coworker all the time. I, ne- I rarely tell this story, but uh, this girl that I used to work with named Katie, I would just snap at her sometimes because uh, I because I felt like I, every time she asked me a question, it was during an, a moment where I had to focus on what I was doing because of my head injury and and then I felt like every time I was being asked something it would just push me into the red and it was nothing Katie did I she actually did nothing wrong um, but I found myself that I, I snapped at her a couple times and that eventually led to me not working at that job anymore which is how I ended up creating Soul Star was because I, I was jobless at the time and so Gene and I were talking and and we put our passions together and he said let's create a Superman story. And I was like, yes, let's do that. And we started on it as Superman. But then as we reached out to DC people and the head of DC, Diane Nelson, and a couple other people, they were like, hey, this is amazing. We're so grateful you want to do this, but we're already doing the Horn of Africa charity. So we can't really do too much right now because we're a business and, and this is what our you know board of directors or whatever comes up with. So we're sorry we can't participate. And that's when we reached out to Rich Johnston and he told us to, to turn Superman into Soul Star and make an original concept. He didn't say the name Soul Star, but he just said, hey, make an original story. And uh, and then that's when I was like, Gene, you definitely got to be a part of this. And we created Soul Star. And what I obviously the goal was to raise awareness for brain aneurysms, which we definitely did. Um, the book got a lot of exposure, which was great. We attempted a Guinness Book of World Records, but we actually were beaten. There's another book that came out that had closer to 200 artists uh, that uh, on a single book, whereas Gene and I were able to wrangle 150 artists, which is still, to me, very, very impressive. Um, <laughs> yeah. And we're really grateful to all those people, some of them who have, are um, sadly no longer with us now. Um, so it that book was something. So even though we didn't raise as much m- money as I would have liked for Aneurysm Foundation, we did donate what we had and we could, but uh, but we did raise awareness. And the one thing I really liked that came out of it was all these people that worked on this book, people that were essentially no names before they got on this book. And they were writing up or drawing a page in a book that had a cover by Sean Galloway or a cover by Kevin Eastman, you know, and it was all these big names and little names working together. First time I feel anything like that has ever really been done on that level. And it, it changed a lot and it changed us and it changed these people's career paths because like Gene and I, who after that were like, we want to start writing comics full time if we can, all these artists uh, ended up, you teamed up with a, t- a bunch of them to continue to create stuff afterwards. Yeah, and I kind of still do. Um, one, uh, Michael Wagoner, and there's there, there's two people that exact same name. Um, yes. This is the guy with this is the guy with the beard. Um, he <laughs> he did he did some stuff for Soul Star, and he's probably my biggest partner in crime right now. There's there aren't too many books that um, I have done that have not has has his name attached to them in one way or another. Uh, David Johnson Jr., his brother Darren, uh, Muhammad Lubis. There's just this, this gang, uh, and I've stayed in touch with them because I've always, I always said to myself, if I can, I will work with any person that I ever worked on Soul Star. You know, I, I'll give them a chance, or I'll work on their projects, whatever they need from me. Uh, but yeah, that's, so a few of us have a thing called Comics United, which is more or less, uh, you know, a Facebook messenger group that we where we kind of cheer each other up and talk and help each other out on projects. David went on to draw my uh, my one shot book Labyrinth of Bones, which I'm extremely proud of, and I have projects brewing with every one of those guys right now. That's amazing, I'm, and I'm glad you you have like you, especially, and I, I've kept in touch with a lot of those guys, but I rarely do. Like in the past, like you know, four and a half years, I haven't really worked in comics anymore, and uh, and I kind of bowed out of it. Uh, but I I do like peeking back into that world, and when I, every time I do, I see you there. And I see these people that worked on Soul Star still collaborating, still coming up with ideas, and still and still trying, you know, like making their way in the industry in the indie world. And it's amazing, dude. And 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 the crazy thing is, is that you helped me at a really d- hard time in my life, whether I showed it or not. Uh, but doing Nerd Nation and and being your friend at that point, like I was going through a lot of the things you're going through now, because as people who, who may not know, or we've been tiptoeing around. You know, Gene is also a brain aneurysm survivor. I had mine in 2010, and I went through my recovery period in that time and be- kind of came back into the world in 2011. Gene had his, what, two, three years ago now? Uh, uh, yeah, was it? I want to say 2015. It might be oh. five years already. And I, I'll never forget that day where uh, I got the 
the message that you were in the hospital for a brain aneurysm. I was working for Omar. That's right. It was 2015 because I, I, I think I was either working for him or I had just quit and I started at Lego. It was one. It was one of the. T- I was in in between. I think, and uh, and I got that call and I cried like you wouldn't believe. And all I kept thinking is, you know, did I fail? Like, you know, I, I, you know, as friends, like I was like, man, he's been friends with me. You know, uh, we've known other people that have potentially died from aneurysms. We never have found the full, you know, uh, diagnostic after they passed away. Some people who worked on Soul Star even, and we were just like, what, you know, what happened to them? And, and I felt like I was like, you know, I, I felt like a failure as a friend. I was like, man, how could I let my friend be afflicted with the same thing that, you know, that nearly killed me. And it, it scared the living hell out of me. And obviously I don't really have any control of that or anything. Uh, and, but, but if anything, it was to show that this aneurysms are worth talking about it, the message to get it out there is worth getting out there because it can strike anybody at any time. And, and I can't imagine, like, I know that was scary for me, but you know, you're, you know, could you explain to people maybe a little bit if you want like how what it's like right now like you know the the anger the the frustration the the way you perceive the world the things that can set you off so easily it's like people don't understand that that struggle yeah. one thing that makes it really really hard is once you have one your chances for getting another one increase big time um and so you're thinking every day even if it's just in the back of your head it's going to happen again and i'm going to die because the chances of living through one of these aren't very uh, aren't very big. We both beat the odds in a big way. Yeah. Um, so we worry that maybe next time that won't be the case. And I know um, Seek has had more. Luckily, they weren't burst and they were taken care of. But, you know, thinking about that every day really sucks. And it makes you makes you on edge. It makes you angry. The, the pain, because there's almost always pain afterwards, almost every day. Um, and you have to live with that. And, yeah, so sometimes you get a little angry. I get angry at stuff now that I never would have before um i i used to be a very very patient person almost to a fault and that's no longer the case you know and i just uh i i hold grudges more now too which i've always been pretty good at holding a grudge but it's got it's gotten way worse uh it's just something you have to deal with and and emotionally it sucks i'm, I'm in a bad place right now i mean i don't want to turn this into a big old pity party but like i'm i'm month to month like surviving and so, you know, financially and stuff, and, and it blows because I want to go back to work. I've always worked for a living. I've always supported myself and never needed anyone to do that for me. And now I can't. And it's just, you know, at this moment, it's me and my youngest son, and it's hard to stay afloat. And it's tough, and it sucks. Yeah, I mean, I I never had to go through anything like this with a son, and so I can't imagine that feeling. And when you told me that, and, you know, I'll just real quickly – if you guys, he, like you said, it's not a pity party. We're just opening up about ourselves. We're just telling you about who we are. So please, you know, we, we both are, we're tough dudes. We're, we're making it through the best we can. Uh, but if any of you out there are feeling generous, I'll put a link down below to Gene's GoFundMe. Um, I have donated to it already. And, uh, and you know, I, I again, like you helped me through a tough time. There was even a time where I was pretty sure I couldn't pay bills. And you were like, hey, do you want me to buy that lantern off you? That green lantern, like white lantern lantern? And I was like, really? And you're like, yeah. And I was like, I'll throw in some other toys. You're like, cool. And I, I sent you like a box of goodies and you helped me and that money helped, helped keep a roof over my head. And it's because of your kindness and the kindness of others. Like it, it um, it means a lot, and you know, and and so that's why when I was like, all right, I'm going to create the show for you know the Parasite podcast. I got to talk to Gene first because I know you're not a big Venom fan, and we'll talk about Venom here in a second because obviously that is a, a a focus of this show. But the other focus of the show is it's the Parasite podcast, which means it's the the single person that I bring on the show. It's about them. I want my audience to get to know you. I want them to get to know each other. Eventually, I'll reach out to people who listen to the show and who have been for years and bring them on this platform. So. So, you know, after after all we've been through, and like I said, go check out the GoFundMe link down below if you want. Uh, Gene, now that you've gone through all this and, and you still deal with this every day, because that's the thing, it's not over. And like you said, you, I, I do. I sometimes I'm afraid to go to sleep because I'm afraid I won't wake up. Um, yeah. And, uh, and that causes anxiety. That causes all kind of stuff. Uh, and it's not healthy to think like that, but it, but it's because we were standing around doing nothing at one point, and then we seemingly dropped dead. Um, uh-huh. And because of that, we will never, ever get over it. 
because uh, because we're worried it'll happen again. So we find these things that keep us busy. Like you said, you want to work. Uh, I want to work. Right now we both don't work. Uh, hopefully that changes for both of us, but it comes with struggles. It comes with challenges that we have to overcome. And one of them is, you know, anger and things like that. Like it is, it took me years, years, and I'm still struggling with it, but years to get into a state where I can meditate more, where I can relax more, where I can let anger go. But I will say I don't win that battle most days. So obviously I'm always here for you if you need me. And I know I'm not the only one. There are other people out there. So, uh, And if anyone out there who's listening to this feels that way, find someone to reach out to. Reach out to one of us. Communicate with us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, because like we say on the show, hashtag we are Venom. That means all of us are in this together. And, uh, and I think, Gene, you're a really strong dude, even though sometimes you don't like compliments and you don't want to admit it, but it's not easy going through what we go through. And so where do you, would you, so I guess like my last question here before we get into the Venom stuff is how do you channel that into a creative endeavor? Because I know that's the thing that is the glue that keeps you together. Well, if I'm well enough to write, that is the thing that absolutely relaxes me the most. Uh, and sometimes reading, although honestly, I have a little bit of trouble reading these days. I can't read quite as much, um, but I still try as much as possible because I love it. But writing is something that I find I can immerse myself into. Um, I'm working on a project I can't really talk much about right now, but uh, I've been working on it for the past couple of days pretty heavy for another person, and it's made me really happy. Um, and honestly, you know what's funny about that is we can't talk about it right now, but it would be the perfect subject for a show called the parasite podcast <laughs> and when i can say more maybe i can come back on and tell you about it that's a that's a deal for sure as soon as you can talk about it you come here and uh and we will talk about it for sure cool cool <laughs> um so speaking of uh, since you got top secret projects which is fine uh, mr top secret uh what let's get into a little bit of the venom stuff we'll talk maybe about five ten minutes about it but uh are, are you a Venom fan? Because that's the whole thing about the show is I'm hoping, you know, I bring people on that aren't fans, who are insulary fans, who kind of have general knowledge of the character. What level would you say you are, and how did you kind of get introduced to the character? Okay, well, let me let me do how I was introduced to the character first. Okay. Um, I am an absolutely huge Spider-Man fan. Um, from probably the late 70s until about the late 90s, I bought Spider-Man Monthly. Every book, every month, there was a point where I was within four appearances of having every Spider-Man appearance, ever. Um, even Marvel Tales stuff. I even bought that just, I, you know, to me it counted as a Spider-Man appearance. Um, and I was a huge Spider-Man fan. And when um, when the alien suit was introduced, you know, and we didn't know anything about it more than it was a suit, I liked it. The design of it was cool. Um you know, the mythology behind it was cool because, I mean, I, I guess there's there's a lot of people that say a fan introduced that costume to Jim Shooter. Yeah, Randy if- Randy Shuler uh, sold the costume design, which I think was originally going to be used for Iron Fist. Um, and uh-huh. and he, he sold it to the, yeah, Jim Shooter for like 220 bucks or something like that. Okay, so, um, so I'm reading all this stuff as it's coming out. And the period of time from Amazing Spider-Man 252 to 268, where he finds out that the costume's alive. Um, And through that and all the other Spider-Man books at that time, that's one of my favorite, very favorite periods of Spidey time for me. It was really good stuff. Um, When when Venom was introduced and we had McFarlane drawing Amazing Spider-Man, which was a big change, because Mark Bagley had drawn it for so long that this change to this, this crazy style with the spaghetti webbing and the you know, the, the weird details and all that cool stuff really invigorated Spider-Man fandom. Um, and the very first couple of Venom appearances I enjoyed, I think, um, like Joker with Bat- over at Batman, I think they probably overused him a bit. But it was the 90s, they overused everything. So, you know, Venom's not necessarily blamed for that. I wasn't a huge fan of most of that stuff. However, I became a hardcore Agent Venom fan, because I thought that stuff was so amazing, especially the Rick Remender run, which like issues one through 22 of that run was so, so good. Yeah, it's it's funny when I talk to people who are, you know, a lot of Venom fans, even hardcore ones like, you know, who grew up with Eddie Brock and liked the Eddie Brock stuff. 
even some of them well i'll ask them like hey who's your favorite venom they'll go flash thompson <laughs> i'm like i'm like yeah no you know and it's funny because someone tried to i think my friend wes on thinking critical podcast he posted the other day he was like hey this article is throwing shade at eddie brock seek and i was like oh really and i went and looked at the article and it said uh flash is the better venom uh, but Eddie's second best or something like that. And I go, yeah, I don't disagree with that. <laughs> like <laughs> Flash Thompson is. And I think that's because like you, I'm a big Spider-Man fan. So, so when that happened, so that, that really pulled you into the character, huh? Yeah. And I think that the Flash stories, I, I think of like the normal Venom, like Eddie Brock stuff as a big action movie. It's fun. Uh, it may not necessarily be the deepest thing in the world, but that's good because it doesn't need to be. It just, you know, it's cool action and there's neat stuff happening. But with Flash, what you got is a little more depth, in my opinion. Um, you, you know, using the suit as an allegory for, for addiction, which, you know, Flash had gone through addiction for a long time. Um, and just the the mood that Remender did, villains like bringing back Jack o Lantern in the most twisted way possible, um, just made for a series that I really, really enjoyed reading. Um, I was pretty disappointed when they threw flash in the space and had him be part of the guardians of the galaxy not a big fan yeah i haven't i haven't gotten to that stuff yet i did buy it all but i'm going to be because this season on my uh, venom vlog show we're going through the flash thompson stuff and we just finished spider island recently um oh cool so i'll be getting oh uh, yeah i'll be getting the minimum carnage soon and circle of uh of five, uh, four and then after that we'll get into uh the cullen bun stuff and then into that so um so I'm excited, and uh, but I'm at the same time I'm also scared because I haven't heard one person say that was a fun time for Flash Thompson Venom fans, and I can understand why. It's Brian Michael Bendis wrote it. <laughs> well, yeah, some of the Cullen Bunn stuff I really enjoyed, yes. especially um, especially his sidekick Mania. Um, I liked her. Nice, yeah, she's a fan favorite. You're actually, I think, going to see her on the Maximum Venom cartoon that's uh, out right now. Uh, so, oh, nice. Yeah, so you're going to see your first, you're going to see Scream, uh, Scorn, and Mania, I believe, are the three female symbiotes are going to use. Right. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see that. It'll be cool to see her in, done in animation. Um, but going back a little bit, you talk about the black costume and, and being of that era of the in the 80s when, when Spider-Man had it. So you must also be loving the current Peter, uh, Peter David miniseries right now. Oh, the Symbiote Spider-Man series, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Especially because Peter David was writing uh, Spectacular Spider-Man during that period. I say I love much, uh, you know, the period of the of the black costume, but not knowing about Venom yet. So having him do it is really, really cool. Yeah, and I know one story you and I agree on is being probably in our, our top Spidey stories of all time. And we've talked about it here on the show. And some people even ask me, like, why are you talking about this as a Spider-Man story? And I go, yes, but it deals with a character that's going to be very important to Eddie Brock later, which is uh, the Sin Eater storyline uh, of uh, the death of Gene DeWolf. Well, yeah, one of my very, very favorite um, stories, Spider-Man stories. And again, that is good, as you said. Um, the Sin Eater story is so good. I'm, I'm a little excited to have him back and see how that works out. Yeah, me too. Someone was mentioning to me that he uh, or a Sin Eater did pop up during Absolute Carnage or right before it for one issue, um, and I forgot about that. I guess he was like resurrected temporarily by by Null or something. Uh, so I'll have to go back and reread that because I, I I'm sure I covered it on the show. But like all things, you know, once I stop talking about it, it's out of my head. <laughs> Pe- right. It's so funny. People are like, "Oh man, you sound so knowledgeable on your show," and I go, "Do you know how much cramming?" exam like like cramming for an exam you know how much reading i'm doing right up until the moment i hit record it's ridiculous right (laughs) um so but that's great to hear i mean you know flash thompson is a fan favorite i'm glad you brought that up because we're dealing with him in our our season right now on venom vlog is there any other types of uh, versions of venom that really stood out to you or just versions you've liked or had a a a strong opinion about positive or negative uh i just love to hear that too before we wrap this up well, I, I guess one of the ones I really, really dislike, um, and I don't like to talk too much about what I dislike, but I'll, I'll do it in this case. Um, there was that brief period of time where, where um, Venom had been auctioned off and that gangster son ended up with him. Oh, that luckily that only lasted like two issues. I know, it wasn't very long. Uh, Matt Garging as, Ven- as Venom was interesting, because I guess they didn't, you know, they didn't feel they had a whole lot to do with um, the character of the Scorpion at that point. Um it was interesting, kind of, but not my favorite either. Um, as far as other versions go, I, I don't know. Um, I, 
I always have a, a little bit of a of a fondness in my heart for uh, that Scream or Screech, the one that was on the Spider Man ride at Universal. Yeah, Scream. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I like her just because she's in that ride. <laughs> We're gonna have uh, probably the biggest Scream fan I know. Uh, she's a follower of mine on Twitter, and she has her own YouTube channel. Uh, she, I think she's a Let's Talk uh, Twitter account, so it's like Let's Talk Scream. And uh, she loves the current comic book. So I was like, you know what? I got to reach out to her. So I reached out to her today, and she said she's going to be a guest on an upcoming episode. So I'm so excited nice. to talk to her about Scream. So you definitely tune into that one if you're a Scream fan. Um, cool. Excellent. Well, that's cool, man. And uh, and any hopes you have? Like, I, I imagine you've seen the first movie. Do you have any thoughts on that? And any hopes that you, you know, as, as someone who's not a hardcore Venom fan, is there something that maybe you would like to see in a second movie that might pull you in to go check it out? Yeah, probably. I think the first movie was exactly what it should have been. What it felt like to me was very much the Marvel movies before there was an MCU. Um, you know, stuff like Blade and the Punisher movies at that period. That's what it reminded me of. That's not a bad thing. Um, because I think, I don't think every movie needs to be part of the MCU, in my opinion. Sure. To, to be totally honest. And I, I think Venom works good. I, would I like to have seen Spider-Man involved in the Venom origin story? Sure. But I understand why it didn't happen. Right. Um, I, I I have this image in my head of like young little Tom Holland looking up at this huge Venom guy standing over him, and I hope that we maybe get to see that at some point because it, it seems like he'd be so just overpowering towards Peter. You know, be such a almost a villain he couldn't he couldn't face off against. Although they'd have to find a way to make him a villain because. I think Venom is very much the anti-hero right away in, in this movie. Well, sure. Well, luckily, Venom looks like a giant monster, so that's it's it's easy to excuse someone who just runs up and punches them out of self-defense. <laughs> so you could easily you could easily cause a beef between him and Spider-Man, no problem. But of course, eventually they'd probably have to team up or whatever. Oh yeah, well that's how comics work anyway. You know? <laughs> exactly. Um, Awesome. Well, that all sounds awesome. And, and Gene, I can't thank you enough for, one, being uh, you know my first guest on this podcast. Uh, everyone out there, if you're interested in hearing more from Gene, I'll put links down below to some of the stuff we talked about, like the you know Nerd Nation. Like you said, Google that, and you can definitely find some old episodes that me and him did together that he did with his friend Jack and that he did with other hosts. Uh, please check out his content. If you want to check out his GoFundMe, I'll put that down below. And, uh, and Gene, is there... Is there any last thoughts? Because, I mean, like I said, this meant a lot to me. We did a Superman podcast recently, which I'm going to, they were a Patreon only, but now that I'm ending my Patreon, uh, I will put those up on YouTube in the coming months. When they go up, I'll let you know. But uh, And then also, when your projects are done, let me know, and I want to have you back on the show and talk about them. But is there any last uh, thoughts that you want to say to the audience out there? Uh, yeah, if you happen to be a creator, um, someone who wants to make comics, maybe you haven't made one yet, Maybe you're a writer or you're an artist, whatever, of any skill level. Um, look, look up Gene Oil on Facebook. That's H O Y L E, um, and let me know because we have a comic called Duration Presents. The entire idea of that book is to get new talent published. Um, what we do is, you know, you give us like a six-page story or whatever that you've put together. Now you don't have to do a whole book because you're part of this anthology book. You're handed the uh, master PDF. And then you're allowed to print that for the rest of your life and sell it at tables. So you'll have something without having to write an entire book and produce an entire book because that's hard, you know, for new for first first timers. That's true. That's we try to make that easier. That's amazing. Yeah. So please, Gene Hoyle, G E N E H O Y L E. Look him up on Facebook. Again, I'll put a lot of his links down below as well. And yeah, he is trying to help other people out there. If you're indie and you feel like you, you just want to break into comics and you have a great idea and you can finish it. Gene's the guy to talk to, and he can help you put it in an anthology book and get it out there for the world. And I like that you offer that you send them a PDF so they can print it on their own and sell it on their own and keep any profits they make. That's a really amazing offer as well. Well, yeah, we don't. We're, I'm not interested in making money in their nation presents. I mean, I, I print copies myself and I sell them because I have something in every issue. Right. But um, it's not about that. It's about getting you know people work out there. That's amazing. And you, I tell you what, guys, you will not find anyone out there more passionate to help others in the comic industry than Gene Hoyle. He's definitely my favorite person that I've ever met in my entire life. And I'm so glad we're still friends and that we've both gone through this uh, these horrible ordeals uh, together and we're still friends in the end. I'm so glad I live just a couple hours from you now. I, I just can't wait to see what adventures we get into in the future. 
Yeah, man. I agree. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Anytime, man. And we'll have you back again. And all you guys, thanks so much. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Leave your comments down below. And if you have any other questions for me or Gene, put them down below and I'll definitely do my best to answer them. And I'll send the questions to Gene and get answers for you guys in upcoming episodes as well. So thank you so much. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you in the future. Peace.